I think we have a we have a quorum. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for taking time to join us today to learn more about this RFP and best practices in submitting a proposal to Arnold Ventures. Uh, my name is Alexius Marcano. I'm a manager of criminal justice research over at AV and will be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, I'd also like to introduce you to Bronte Forsgren, who is a policy analyst on the evidence-based policy team. Uh, Bronte will be handling the technical side of the presentation. So please feel free to message her privately with any technical difficulties that might come up. Um, also, as just some logistical background, um, I want to let you all know that all participants are muted. However, you should feel free to submit any questions that you might have at any time using the Q&A button, uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so if you could please use that rather than the chat box, then our panelists will be sure to address them at the end of this presentation. We'll also be sharing a copy of this PowerPoint to everyone who registered for the event and can provide a recording of today's webinar upon request if needed. And now uh, I'd like to pass it over to Jocelyn Fontaine and Amanda Modderson Cox to discuss the RFP, which you can find a link for in the chat. Thank you, Alexius, and welcome everybody to the webinar. I really appreciate your interest in this uh, funding opportunity and I'm excited for the conversation and looking forward to more applications through this opportunity. Um, so I'm Jocelyn Fontaine. I'm the Vice President of Criminal Justice Research at Arnold Ventures, and I'm responsible for identifying and developing research investments across the various portfolios of our criminal justice initiative. I'm really uh, happy to be sharing facilitation of this conversation with my colleague, Amanda Modderson-Cox, um, who is a director on the evidence-based policy team, uh, and she's gonna introduce her off in a few moments. We decided to divide and conquer this conversation. I'm going to take the first portion of the conversation and walk you through the criteria and a little bit of background on uh, our sort of history of supporting uh, randomized control trials. And then Amanda's going to take the latter half and talk a bit about some tips uh, for um, submitting under this, this opportunity and uh, do a preview of one uh, recent award that we've made um, under this uh, solicitation. So um, Arnold Ventures, uh, for those of you who aren't um, super familiar with our, our organization, is a philanthropy that has a core mission to invest in evidence-based solutions that maximize opportunity and minimize injustice. Our mission is to identify and support lasting policy and systemic change that improves people's lives. And we do this by investing in research and building a real strong body of evidence to drive public conversation that can be used to craft policy and inspire action. And our organization works primarily in four key substantive uh, areas, uh, criminal justice, health, education, and public finance. And we use the tools of research, policy advocacy, and strategic communication uh, to identify, inform, and advance policy change. As I mentioned today, um, we'll be talking about a funding opportunity that's available through a joint effort or a joint venture of our criminal justice initiative, of which I'm a representative, as I mentioned, and our evidence-based policy team, of which Amanda is a representative. And just to give you um, a sort of top-line overview of those two initiatives within AB, our evidence-based policy team supports randomized control trials across the variety of social policy areas where prior evidence shows the potential for sizable effects and important outcomes. And our criminal justice initiative makes investments in research and policy advocacy that advances community safety and the values of fairness, effectiveness, and racial justice in the areas of policing, pretrial justice, community supervision, prisons, reintegration, and fines and fees. Um, uh, Bronte, you can go back to the previous slide. Um, so I just want to give a very quick note on language before we get into the substance of our conversation. Um, and that's just perhaps useful to make sure that we're all on the same page about what a randomized control trial is. Um, an RCT, or an experimental evaluation, as it's also sometimes called, is a study where individuals or sometimes clusters of individuals like communities are randomly assigned uh, to either a treatment group um, that receives some type of intervention, a program, or a practice, or to a control group that does not receive that same intervention program or practice. And what makes an RCT uniquely strong in terms of measuring impact is that the process of random assignment ensures that on average, there's no differences between the two groups 
um, other than the intervention, and therefore we can be reasonably confident that any differences observed between a treatment and a control group from a well-executed randomized trial are due to the intervention, the program, or the practice that's being tested. I just want to mention that AV invests in a range of other types of research studies and designs from descriptive studies to non-experimental studies that use uh, various uh, different types of methodologies. And we also recognize that an RCT is not always feasible, uh, but for the purposes of this conversation today and this open request for proposals, we are focused on RCTs, but I invite uh, folks in the audience and to tell your friends uh, to check out the resources page of the Arnold Ventures website, where we've posted several uh, research agendas that are uh, aligned with our programmatic areas that describe various key outcomes, research objectives, and research questions and methods, again, outside of RCTs, but also including them that are of interest and high priority to us. A guiding principle behind our work in funding RCTs is that we know from our own experience and the history of um, looking at rigorous program evaluations is that few interventions, and by interventions we do mean policies, programs, and practices, et cetera, succeed in producing meaningful impacts on the outcomes they're seeking to improve. And this is true across many policy areas, including criminal justice, right? And this makes sense. Difficult, complex problems um, are hard to solve. But we also know that exceptional interventions uh, do exist, with, which have been shown to produce important improvements on key outcomes in well-conducted RCTs. And we believe that some of the lack of progress in solving hard problems, complex problems, and driving meaningful policy change is that there's too few interventions that are backed by sufficiently strong evidence and available to policymakers, practitioners, um, and other key stakeholders. And so our goal with this RFP is to increase the number of proven effective interventions uh, in criminal justice in particular uh, by funding RCTs. So next slide, Bronte. Um, we thought it would make sense uh, to start by giving folks just a sense of our investments in this space, because uh, we hear this a lot, like what, what have you done here? Um, what have awards look like? Um, what are you looking for in applications? And we just wanted to sort of ground the conversation here. So um, our evidence-based policy team, and again, they work across uh, social policy areas, including but not limited to criminal justice. So this includes all of them. Uh, so since uh, 2015, the evidence-based policies team, which is focused on uh, supporting RCTs, has funded a little over 100 RCTs, totaling over $60 million. The average grant award amount um, is about uh, $567,000, um, with the majority falling under the $500,000 range. Uh, our investments in RCTs have ranged from a low of $50,000 to nearly $3 million. Um, and this variation is because um, we are sometimes funding low cost um, RCTs um, that um, add follow-up periods or, or add um, another study site. And then other times we're funding um, full um, uh, RCTs that include multiple sites and, and um, uh, long follow-up periods. On the CJ side, um, uh, and this is um, uh, RCTs that we've supported in the criminal justice space, sort of outside of or building on um, what uh, the evidence-based policy team has done on other social policy areas, um, over a shorter period of time, so just uh, since 2019, uh, we've funded uh, 15 RCTs uh, that are totaling over $17 million. Again, these projects have included um, a range from a low of $50,000 to nearly $3 million, and the average award amount has been about um, $1.2. And again, we just uh, let folks know that this is um, uh, what uh, awards in the past have looked like for us so that you can think about that when you're um, developing your grant application. So now I'm going to focus on the four uh, selection criteria that we use to assess letters of interest that come our way. And I'll talk about these criteria again so just broadly, and then I'll pass it on to my colleague Amanda, who's going to highlight um, uh, some tips and uh, tricks in um, uh, developing these uh, letters of interest uh, to send our way and what a successful proposal would look like. Um, so our first um, and key uh, selection criteria is that 
Um, we're seeking applications to conduct RCTs of criminal justice programs, practices, and interventions where the intervention, and again, that includes programs and practices and models, is backed by promising prior evidence suggesting it could produce sizable impacts on important criminal justice outcomes of clear policy relevance. So that can range, but for the types of outcomes that we're talking about is that you know, an intervention will prevent or reduce violence, it'll reduce recidivism, reduce racial disparities, or improve health or employment outcomes for people with histories of, of system involvement. And those are just some examples. The other way to meet this criteria is that the intervention is widely adopted in practice, um, but it hasn't yet been rigorously evaluated, uh, and its key impacts or its impacts on cre key criminal justice outcomes is largely unknown or that the intervention is growing in use and is um, likely to become widely adopted, but it hasn't yet been rigorously evaluated. I want to say here that we specifically encourage applications that are seeking to replicate findings from prior rigorous evaluations um, that seem especially promising, um, but the findings aren't yet conclusive. Uh, for example, due to some study limitations like only a short follow-up period, a single study site design, or a well-matched comparison group, but not randomization. And the reason that we put such a premium on promising prior evidence is that, as mentioned earlier, um, from our assessment, most interventions are found to have weak or no effects when they're ultimately evaluated in a sizable RCT. Um, and so we hope to maximize our chances by focusing on um, uh, interventions that have um, a signal of strong prior evidence. We're hoping to maximize our chances of identifying interventions um, that are capable of improving people's lives in a really meaningful way. Our next selection criteria is, importantly, a valid study design. Um, and so we are looking here for studies that have sufficiently large sample sizes and other elements that are needed to generate credible evidence about the program's impact on one or more targeted outcomes, again, of high policy relevance. So we're looking for applicants to describe what are the primary outcomes of interest, how will these be measured and over what period of time, and um, the analysis methods that you'll use uh, to assess uh, the impact of an intervention. We're really uh, encouraging designs that measure, measure outcomes in both the short and the longer term. Uh, we think that's really critical to see whether the effects uh, endure long enough to constitute meaningful improvement in people's lives. And we know from um, uh, assessing the literature that um, uh, outcomes can look different if studied over different periods of time. The follow-up period, so this isn't a hard and fast rule for us that we're looking for, you know, all studies to have X um, outcome period. It really de uh, depends on the specifics of the study and the intervention that's being tested in the research question, but we welcome um, uh, proposals that have longer follow-up periods, again, so we can see whether uh, infects endure over time. Um, we funded studies with follow-up periods ranging from one year all the way up to more than a decade, in fact, um, and the typical study that we support um, has a follow-up period that ranges from uh, two to four years. Um, to give folks a sense of what we look for when assessing the strength of a, um, a proposed design, um, the RFP links, you'll see that there's a document that's hyperlinked there uh, that we prepared that's called Key Items to Get Right When Conducting an RCT of Social Programs. And what I want to lift up today, and Amanda will talk a little bit more about this uh, in a bit, is that we're looking for relatively simple analyses uh, rather than um, complex methods since we want to be able to clearly and transparently convey the findings um, of the studies that we support to policymakers and stakeholders. Um, and we find that simple methods are typically just as rigorous as those from more complex methods and are easier to convey um, to folks outside of the academy. Um, and I will say, um, related to this last uh, bullet here on the slide, is that while this opportunity is generally seeking to fund RCTs, we're also open to considering submissions for rigorous quasi or non-experimental evaluations. If the applicant can make a really compelling case, compelling and convincing case, uh, then an RCT is not feasible. Our next selection criteria is experienced researcher. Um, and um, what we're looking for here is that the applicant study team, so um, not just the principal investigator, but that the study team includes at least one researcher uh, in a key substantive role who has previously carried out a well-conducted RCT. 
And the reason why this is um, a key criteria for us is that we've seen um, from monitoring the research literature and again from our, our own experience is that there's a myriad of ways uh, that an RCT can go wrong and that RCTs really do require um, training and skill to design and implement successfully in order to, to try to, to guard against um, uh, uh, problems in, in executing it well. And so our view is that to give uh, the good a study a good chance of being implemented well and of being implemented successfully, uh, someone on the research team in a meaningful role should have the previous experience of implementing an RCT. Um, to assess whether the team Again, the entire applicant team sort of meets this criteria. We're asking for folks to submit at least one report from a prior RCT um, that someone on the proposed study team has played a meaningful role. Um, and we assess those uh, reports to make sure that the study is well conducted. Um, I want to say that we recognize the importance of expanding and diversifying the pool of researchers um, with RCT experience and do not intend for the specific selection criteria uh, to be a barrier to, applicant, to applications or applicants who have good ideas, good study ideas, and good designs. And so we really encourage researchers who are new to RCTs, if it's their first one, uh, including researchers from racial and ethnic backgrounds um, or groups that are historically underrepresented in the research community to participate in this funding opportunity. And we just wanna underscore that while the principal um, investigator doesn't have to have this prior, select, this prior um, experience, we're just requesting that someone who's on the team have this experience um, as long as they're uh, in a key role on the study um, uh, and will help um, the new um, uh, the new researcher, the person that's new to RCTs, um, will support them um, on the study design. And um, we are sensitive, again, to making sure that this isn't a, sub a substantial barrier to folks um, applying to this opportunity. And so if you have questions about whether your study team meets the criteria, um, we absolutely invite you to reach out to us to directly um, for assistance in addressing this uh, selection criteria. Okay, our next um, selection criteria is focused on funding and the partners that are um, associated with the project. And our preference is that the funding go principally towards the costs of conducting uh, the randomized control trial, as opposed to covering uh, program delivery or intervention costs. Um, that said, you'll see language in the RFP um, that we are open uh, and may agree to fund a portion of the program delivery costs if the program is backed by particularly promising evidence uh, and if the investment in the program delivery is necessary for the RCT to go forward. Um, Regardless of how uh, the intervention itself is going to be funded, we are absolutely looking for letters of commitment uh, from um, uh, partners to ensure that the program itself will be implemented and thus uh, will be evaluated using random assignment. And we especially encourage agreements um, in which the necessary parties um, not only support the study, but also provide a credible description of how they or others would use the study findings to inform program uh, delivery or policy um, decisions. Um, in addition to looking for those funding commitments for program delivery, we're also looking to make sure that all of the necessary study partners, including those who will be providing uh, outcome data, which we know is, is generally outside of um, uh, the researchers sort of scope of work that they're looking for, um, government partners, for example, we want to make sure that those um, agreements are in place. And we don't expect that all of the commitments or all sort of data sharing agreements have been signed and in place but at the time of the um, funding application process. But we do expect all of those details to be nailed down um, in advance of making a grant award and that there's plans in place for, for executing on data sharing agreements, for example. All right. Um, the last slide here for me is that I just wanted to give you uh, an overview of our review process. Um, so we try to make this process uh, as streamlined and as easy as possible uh, for both applicants and for our team. Um, applications are accepted on a rolling basis. There is no submission deadline, but we're encouraging your applications, hence this conversation. We really want to see your ideas. Um, and we're also making grants on a rolling basis throughout the year as well. Uh, for initial submissions, we're asking for three-page letters of interest that address the primarily 
the promising or the widely adopted uh, intervention criteria and the experienced researcher um, criteria. And we want you to provide enough detail on the study design so we have a general sense of its parameters and can assess its rigor. We also ask uh, that the letter of um, letters of interest provide an indication of the overall funding amount that's being requested of, of Arnold Ventures, which can be an estimate or a tight range. And at this stage, again, we're not expecting um, uh, you to have necessarily all of the um, necessary partnerships or commitments in place for program implementation, data collection, random assignment. But you should be able to articulate a clear path or a plan toward getting those commitments and those details in place. We'll review uh, the letters of interest that come into us, and we usually have an approximately one month turnaround for doing that. Um, and if we find um, that the letter of interest effectively addresses all of the selection criteria, we will invite you to submit um, a six page full proposal for our consideration. Um, and we will ask that applicants address the questions that our reviewers raise about the letter of interest, and again, flesh out more details about um, the study design itself. Um, like the letter of interest, um, um, we review the full proposals in about um, 30 days, uh, try to expedite that process so that you'll hear from us pretty quickly. Um, and then once we reviewed either the letter of interest or the full proposal, there's often some back and forth uh, to get clarification on certain aspects of the project. Um, applicants can very much expect feedback from our reviewers um, about strengthening the study design and uh, trying to get it um, to a place um, that we can support uh, the project. Um, on average, um, when we look at our sort of past performance, uh, the time from LOI submission uh, to a funding decision from our board, assuming that we've invited a full proposal, uh, has ranged from about four to six months. Um, and for projects that are ultimately awarded funding, we require public online registration of a pre-analysis plan that lays out the key elements of the study. And then we strongly encourage grantees to share their data to the extent feasible uh, with the broader research community as a part of our organization's wider commitment um, uh, to research transparency. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Amanda. Great, thank you, Jocelyn. So um, I'm the director of evidence-based policy here at Arnold Ventures, um, and I lead our work to build evidence for and expand access to programs and interventions, as Jocelyn mentioned, across all areas of social policy uh, that have been shown to meaningfully improve people's lives in well-conducted RCTs. So this means that our team is both funders of and also avid consumers of RCT evaluations in numerous policy areas. Um, and we're thrilled to be partnering with our criminal justice colleagues on this RFP to try to build more of this type of evidence in an area that is obviously of great importance, both to the foundation um, and to society as a whole. So the goal for this section is to offer you some hopefully helpful advice in submitting successful proposals to our RFP. I'll flag a few things that we want to especially see in those initial letters of interest, LOIs, and a few common mistakes that we recommend you try to avoid when pulling together your initial LOI. So I'm gonna start by discussing our promising or widely adopted criterion. Uh, this really is our most important criterion. Essentially with this criterion, we're asking for you to demonstrate that there's a compelling reason to rigorously evaluate the specific intervention. Um, and just a note here, I'm gonna follow Jocelyn's lead and use intervention as shorthand for really any policy program or practice, et cetera. So you can do this, meet this criterion in one of two ways. The first is to demonstrate that the intervention has been shown to be sufficiently promising in prior evidence. So as Jocelyn spoke about, a guiding principle behind our work funding RCTs is that we know from the history of rigorous program evaluations and our own work that surprisingly few interventions succeed in producing meaningful impacts on the outcomes that they're seeking to improve when rigorously evaluated in an RCT. With this criterion in the RFP, we're trying to improve our odds of finding things that do work by making investments in rigorous evaluations of interventions that already have some strong signal from prior research that they might be effective. To demonstrate this, we ask that you discuss in your LOI a relevant RCT or other evaluation study of an intervention that is either identical to or very similar to the intervention that you're proposing to study. So we'll ask that you please provide accurate citations and even better if you can send along the papers, uh, that's great as well. 
In the LOI, we want you to describe the findings of the studies that you're submitting as prior evidence and then how the intervention being studied that you're proposing to study is either related to or identical to that that was um, evaluated in the supporting prior evidence. Uh, one caution on this, we'll sometimes get LOIs that kind of throw out six to eight different references, and it just isn't really clear whether or how what was studied in those papers is really relevant to what you're proposing to study. So that's something that we, we look at, would ask you to avoid. Um, and another note on this is that we expect that you'll consider and use the prior evidence in discussing your study design. So, for example, discuss how the target population that you plan to study may be similar or different from that that was studied in the prior evidence. Um, we'll also, we also like to see that you've considered the size of the impacts found in the particular studies that you're citing and benchmark your power calculations with like realistic expectations about what effect sizes can be achieved with the intervention that you're studying. So in this, keeping in mind, you'll likely need to discount effect sizes from non-experimental studies since they're typically larger than those that are found in RCTs. And similarly, account for the fact that a replication RCT often finds smaller effects than those found in the original study. The second way that you can address this criterion then is with um, this widely adopted or soon to be widely adopted is also mentioned in the um, RFP. So by this, we mean that we're open to evaluating interventions that are currently being widely implemented with public funding that can be local, state or federal investment but that have not yet been rigorously evaluated and therefore their effectiveness is unknown. So the idea here is that we can either show that they're working, which would be great, or if not, we can learn that and then divert resources to more effective interventions. So what exactly do we mean by widely adopted? Uh, this can be several different things. It can mean that it's being implemented in multiple locations or across a state, or even in some cases, um, a large city, and with significant public investment to some degree. Um, and then we are also often open to things that are arguably soon to be widely adopted, by which we mean, for example, one jurisdiction is doing it and others have expressed a real interest in replicating it, or um, kind of actual money is in the process of being committed. But on this in particular, you'll really need to make a compelling case for us. Um, so for example, an idea that a lot of academics are talking about is generally not gonna be sufficient for soon to be widely adopted. The key point here is that we don't, we don't want you to just state that an intervention is popular or is implemented widely. Rather, we'd ask for you to share some data on this. So for example, the number of users, the number of service providers using the model, or the amount of money that's spent annually at the city, state, or federal level. And it's even better if you can show us that public officials are also committed to using the evidence that your study will produce, for example, via their letters of support. Uh, great, thanks, Bronte. So in both cases, um, what we're asking for you to do is convince us that the intervention you propose to evaluate is very similar in key components to the intervention that you're either providing promising evidence for or showing is um, in widespread use. And so by this, we mean that you might need to demonstrate, for example, that the dosage or the intensity is similar um, across the, the prior evidence and what you're proposing, or that the setting or target population is comparable, and if not, how they differ and why that matters. Um, we also want you to show that the intervention can be or preferably has already been successfully delivered under real world implementation conditions. So in most cases, we'll want to see, or additionally, in most cases, we'll want to see that the intervention is being delivered successfully in the proposed study location before the evaluation or random assignment begins. Um, but this could be addressed, for example, with a six month pilot period that you include um, as part of the project proposal. A couple last notes on this. I'll just mention that sometimes making the promising prior evidence and or the widely adopted case can be a little bit of a stretch. And in some ways you could make both cases. If you think you can both make both cases, it doesn't hurt to attempt to do so in the letter of interest. And then we'll generally provide feedback to you on where to focus for the full proposal. Lastly, um, with this RFP, I just wanna be clear that we're really not looking to fill a gap in the literature or evaluate kind of any program that is addressing an important problem. So as we all know, there's no shortage of important problems. 
Um, but our mission here is to focus on identifying the subset of outstanding solutions that have been credibly shown um, to solve such problems. So therefore, we're really looking for some signal that a prior particular intervention is worth testing because we think it might help solve the problem or that it has a compelling reason to be evaluated because it's already being widely used to attempt to address this particular problem. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide, thank you. So now I'm gonna discuss a few things to keep in mind um, when thinking about your study design. Um, as Jocelyn spoke to, we're really looking for simple, well-powered studies that will convincingly answer the key research question. Does the program move the needle on the targeted outcome? Uh, so I'll start off by talking about power. The proposed RCT needs to have a large enough sample to detect effects that we might reasonably expect to find based on the prior evidence. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to be realistic about this and to take the earlier findings into consideration. So for example, if a previous RCT finds that an intervention, for example, decreased recidivism by 15 percentage points, you should increase your sample size so that the replication study that you're proposing could detect a smaller effect, say 10 percentage points. As a general rule of thumb, we're usually talking about RCTs and studies that have sample sizes in the hundreds at least. And uh, just note that we typically don't fund small efficacy trials in more controlled settings. We're really looking to test interventions as they would be implemented in the real world. With regards to those important outcomes, again, Jocelyn talked a little bit about this. We're really looking for studies that measure meaningful life or system outcomes, not just proxy outcomes or intermediate outcomes. And this can be outcomes in a number of domains, um, but the ultimate target outcome should be something that's easily understood by a layperson or a policymaker as a meaningful improvement in somebody's life. So, for example, testing whether an intervention meaningfully reduces um, arrests, incarceration, victimization, homelessness, or improves educational achievement, employment, or health, um, or even at the system level, like reduces uh, racial disparities or, or population sizes, um, for example, the percent under supervision, something like that. It's okay to also measure short-term outcomes, and in some cases this might be necessary just to ensure that program take-up is going well, um, and for example, there's sufficient treatment contrast, but the ultimate primary outcome should be the main outcome of interest and the outcome to which your study is powered. And we ask that you discuss that um, in the LOI. Um, additionally, again, multiple, many of our studies occur over multiple years. We wanna see enduring impacts. So that's typically whether effects can be sustained beyond the end of the intervention. We're always on the lookout for a long-term follow-up. Um, of course, long-term follow-up, it depends on the intervention and the outcome, but in most cases, this means at least one year beyond the end of the intervention. And as Jocelyn spoke to earlier, typically our studies have follow-up between two and four years. Next, with respect to the counterfactual, we want to see that the study will measure the program's impact in the treatment group as compared to a pure control group, also known as treatment as usual or business as usual. So we usually don't want to know just whether like two versions of the program compared to one another. Um, instead, we'll want to know if the program is an improvement over and above what participants might be getting anyway. So um, the treatment as usual group. And then lastly, what we mean by simple, clear designs that convincingly answer the primary research question includes avoiding things like multi-armed trials, two by two factorial designs or step wedge designs. All of these are most likely unnecessary and overly complicated to answer the key research question that we're primarily asking. Um, not to mention typically these types of study designs also require larger sample sizes than is uh, feasible in most cases. Um, we do fund cluster RCTs and occasionally trials that have more than one treatment arm where we've been convinced that it's important to do so, uh, but generally the goal here is simplicity, a clean study design that ideally can be explained to any non-researcher. I'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide, but this is also relevant from a study cost perspective. So we look for streamlined and efficient data collection. What do you need to answer the key questions? It's probably not surveys at three, six, nine, 12, and 24 months. So next slide, please. 
In terms of cost considerations, just a few points on what we'll look for in the study budget. And also I wanna note that you do not need to submit a full budget at the LOI stage, really just a rough estimate of the total study cost, um, either a number or a range is fine. Um, if we invite a full proposal, we'll work with you on aligning the overall budget with our expectations. But a couple of things to keep in mind. So as I was just mentioning, data collection should be as streamlined and efficient as possible in order to credibly measure effects on the key primary outcomes. We generally prefer to measure outcomes with administrative data, the collection of which tends to be both cheaper and often higher quality, or at least uh, typically less subject to things going wrong. So for example, police records for arrests, unemployment insurance data for earnings, things like this, rather than fielding surveys, which can suffer from higher differential attrition, recall and social desirability bias, and also typically uh, drastically increase the budget. But as I'll talk about in a minute with the example that I'm going to share, if there's a compelling reason for original data collection, we are open to it. Um, although we'll also often ask that the survey data be corroborated with administrative data. Um, additionally, the overall study cost should be generally commensurate with the level of supporting evidence. So in other words, the size of the grant that we're willing to award is in part determined by how well the LOI meets our criteria, especially the promising or widely adopted criterion. For example, we're willing to provide larger grants for studies and interventions that have very promising prior evidence, for example, large effects found in a previously well-conducted single-site RCT, or are in very widespread use and with a compelling demonstration that the evidence produced will be actionable. If a study has suggestive evidence, like from a small um, non-experimental study, we're generally less interested in funding like a multi-million dollar multi-site RCT that's gonna deploy multiple surveys. All right, so I'm gonna, before we wrap up, I'll just talk about one of the examples of a study that we funded through this RFP. So this was a randomized control, or this is an ongoing randomized control trial of the intervention functional family therapy gangs. FFTG, for those that don't know, is a manualized therapeutic intervention um, that's been adapted for gang-involved youth in which a master's level therapist works with the youth and their families, usually in a home setting, to deliver the intervention in approximately weekly one-hour therapy sessions over a four to five month period. The primary aim is to reduce youth's involvement in antisocial activity by addressing negative peer relationships, normative beliefs about rules and laws, unhealthy family functioning, substance use, and uh, the like. And the therapists are both trained and then overseen by a national office that tracks service delivery trends and youth outcomes to ensure adherence to the model. So FFTG was previously tested in a small RCT that was conducted in Philadelphia uh, between 2014 and 2016. And the study had a sample of 129 juveniles who were on probation and who'd been flagged as being at risk of gang involvement. Over an 18 month period, the study found that FFTG led to sizable, these were roughly 10 to 15 percentage point reductions in the percent of youth arrested, rearrested, um, percent with drug charges, felony charges, and property charges, and the percent adjudicated for any offense. So although, uh, due to the study's small sample size, several of the effects found did not quite reach statistical significance. So this is a good example of promising prior evidence. There were large effects found, but the earlier study was arguably underpowered and could benefit from a replication in any event. So under the funded project, uh, researchers from the University of Colorado will attempt to replicate the findings from the Philadelphia study in a new location in Denver uh, with a larger sample of 400 juveniles who are on probation, and that's more than three times that of the original Philadelphia study. And the study will also aim to recruit a more gang-involved sample than in the prior study. This is based on suggestive evidence from the Philadelphia study that the program may be more effective with youth who are already embedded in gangs. The study's primary outcomes will be uh, recidivism measured 18 months after random assignment with both administrative records and survey data. The two primary outcomes specifically will be the percent with any criminal or delinquent charge and the percent with any adjudication or conviction during the follow-up period. Um, so as I mentioned, 
In this case, uh, we believe that uh, the collection of survey data, in addition to the administrative data that they're going to be using, was warranted. And this is because, first of all, the surveys will measure some important outcomes that are not available in the administrative records, including gang embeddedness and substance use. And then also, and this is important here, because judges and probation officers cannot be blinded to study assignment in this case, we thought it would be important to corroborate the administrative records with survey data. So the reason for this is that it's plausible that these officials' knowledge of juveniles' treatment assignment could cause them to be more lenient in response to um, FFTG participants' uh, infractions. And if this were to occur systematically, then it could inflate the impact estimates as measured with administrative records and overstate the program's impact. So that's why we thought it would be important to corroborate with survey data as well. But I will add that we worked with the survey team to streamline those survey efforts as much as possible in order to limit the overall budget implications. So for context, the total award for this study uh, was a little under $1.2 million. So I'm going to pause there, or stop there rather, and I'll turn it over to Alexis, who's going to take us into the Q&A. Hey, thank you. That's right. So now we're going to begin the question and answer portion of the presentation. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit any questions you might have using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so as a first question, are there any specific criminal justice topics that you're seeking proposals for? Do you want to take this, Jocelyn? Um, yeah, um, the question is, we are open, so um, uh, though our sort of programmatic team on the CJ side is focused on specific strategic areas, and I've laid them out, and it does run the gamut from, you know, policing uh, uh, to prisons, we really are open in this case to um, programs and interventions that meet the criteria, and we're not looking for um, to develop the body evidence, a body of evidence in a specific area. So we really do invite you if you have an idea that meets the criteria as they're as outlined in the RFP, then we are open uh, to your ideas and um, yeah, and welcome them. Yeah, that's great. I'll just add. I mean, I think part of the reason for this is that. We're all, we are already limiting ourselves to some degree by restricting it to something that has prior evidence or is widespread use. And so for that reason, we're really open to kind of topic area and intervention area. Excellent. Um, we have another question. So what are the most common mistakes that people make when sending these proposals? <laughs> That's a good one. So I think I, I went through some of them. Um, I think that a big one, I mean, really, as I mentioned, the most important criterion for us is that you demonstrate that the intervention has met the threshold for promising prior evidence or um, widespread use. And I, a lot of times we'll get um, things that are, you know, the, there's a lot of effort going into demonstrating that the the problem or the issue that the intervention is trying to resolve is an important one, um, but then kind of glazing over whether or not it's an intervention or a solution that is being widely used or has been demonstrated to some degree to be effective. So I think that's one of the big ones. Um, another big one, which is kind of less uh, um, basically that we can work with you on a little bit more is, um, is, is kind of overly complex designs and including no multiple components that are going to elevate the cost of the study. So that's something where if you've met that original threshold and we think that there's something promising here, that's where um, we'll follow up with you. You know, we'll invite the full proposal and then walk through and provide a lot of feedback on what, how we'd like to kind of shape the study in order to better meet um, our expectations for, for that component. Dawson, do you want to add anything? Nope. Thank you, Amanda. I think you all covered it. Excellent. Uh, do you have a preferred geographic scale for research proposals, such as local, statewide, or multi-site projects? Good question. Do I take this? Sure. So yeah, the short no. answer is no. <laughs> um, other than 
So in order to meet a sufficient sample size, that is where it does, it, you know, it can be somewhat limiting. Um, if you're working in like a very small jurisdiction, it might make sense to try to do a multi-site study. Um, but beyond that, like we don't have any specific things that we're looking for in terms of data. Yeah, and um, so just to build on that, and um, of course, this is sort of um, researcher best practice is that to the extent that we have an opportunity to um, assess an intervention that's being implemented in multiple places, and we can do that rigorously, um, uh, then we would be, be welcome to that since we, we think it adds in the generalizability of the findings and the potential uh, to inform policy and practice in multiple places. Excellent. And uh, can anyone submit a, a proposal? Do you need to be affiliated with a university to submit? That's a great question. So the short answer is yes, anyone can submit as long as you can demonstrate that you've got somebody on the team with, um, with that researcher experience that Jocelyn was talking about. Um, typically, we are making awards to like to the researcher and usually it's at their institution, um, although sometimes it might be like a research firm or, a, you know, a small consulting group. Um, but we do occasionally uh, provide funding for the study to um, folks that are implementing the intervention, whether it's government or a nonprofit, um, and then the sub award is to the researcher. So the short story is we're, you know, depending on circumstances, we're open to different ways of um, or different primary grants. Brilliant. And what are some additional examples of demonstrating that other jurisdictions would be interested in a multi-site study other than letters of support? That's a good question. Um, the letters of support, yes, in that, um, you know, that there's sufficient uh, detail enough in your study design that, you know, that, you know, you've been able to demonstrate that you have a sense of what the data holdings are, the potential for them are, and that there's that commitment to um, adhering to the random assignment. So that's what, I, and we know that some, you know, the, the details matter. And of course the planning fate is just that it's a plan and implementation can ho hopefully not look too much different, but can be different. But I think that's what we're looking for you to do is to articulate that you've got a commitment and that the design um, is, um, uh, well sort of considered or contextualized within those multiple places, um, you know, to, to assess the rigor, that it's valid and feasible. Yeah, and just to reiterate, I think Jocelyn said this earlier, but you don't need to necessarily include those letters of support at the LOI stage. I know they can be challenging to get at times, but you should probably at least have had, you know, meaningful conversations and understand what will be necessary in order to establish um, those things for us at a later point. Great. And um, do the, does the evidence-based policy team review RFPs from across all initiatives, or do they have subject matter expertise to review those from, say, only criminal justice or healthcare or another area? Got it. So I think this review proposals is what um, the question is about, right? So, um, yeah, so on this particular RFP, we're partnering with our subject matter experts on the criminal justice team. Um, we do also have additional consultants who work with us um, and who have expertise in, in various areas um, when reviewing proposals from other, other policy areas and also other teams at AV as well. Excellent. And... Um... How can someone learn more about other RFPs from Arnold Ventures? Um, so I was going to do this at the end, but it's a it's a great question generally. But for this particular moment, since we just released a request for proposals um, uh, under our reducing violent crime strategy, um, and we're going to have an informational webinar for that particular RFP tomorrow at the same time, so at two p.m. And Alexis is going to drop into the chat. Um, uh, the information to join us for that conversation. Um, that opportunity is not focused specifically on RCTs, so we would welcome them, but um, uh, you can find more information um, about that RFP opportunity available on our website. And again, um, we have um, an informational webinar that'll focus specifically on that opportunity tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, and as Amanda mentioned, we also have another sort of open RFP that the evidence-based policy team is managing um, that's not CJ specific, it's for social programs broadly, and that's also available on our website under the 
um, RFP um, tag at the top of our website. Maybe Bronze, you can drop that into the chat. Thanks for the question. And do you have any particular expectations around publication, such as do publications need to be in peer reviewed journals? That is a good question. Um, again, short answer is no. Um, we, but we do have expectations around research transparency. So one of the things that we require as part of, um, that we you know, discuss in, in the grant agreements if we move to that stage is both that the study be publicly registered, which um, I mentioned earlier, and that the results ultimately be available, be made available publicly. Um, and this can be, you know, obviously it can take some time after the end of the study. So we're, we can be flexible on this, um, but we do, uh, we do follow up with grantees and, and ensure that that study findings are available at the very least in, um, in a, in a preprint um, on, on our open science framework or something of the sort. Um, and then of course we also fund evaluations where um, where the, the grantee is a, you know, a research firm like an MDRC or an APT or something like that and they are typically self-publishing. Um, that's perfectly acceptable as well. And I just wanna underscore, right? So the, our organization and what we're committed to is that we very much appreciate um, dissemination activities and publications that are about uh, the non-academic audience. And so, um, you know, that can look different um, and, and obviously it is based on the specifics of the research projects, but really invite uh, dissemination activities that are about getting the research findings into the hands of decision makers. Excellent. Um, could you also provide some advice about quasi-experimental designs that Arnold Ventures would be open to funding? Um, and with that, any kind of common mistakes that you've seen in prior applications featuring quasi-experimental designs? Sure. So I do believe linked in the RFP is a little bit of guidance on kind of what like basically what our team's take is on what um, makes for a particularly rigorous uh, quasi-experiment. So with preference to RDDs um, and something that uh, like a, kind of less interested in, in your sort of standard propensity score match study where the counterfactual might not be quite so solid. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll also let uh, Jocelyn jump in on this. Yeah, um, and I think I think that, um, so uh, underscoring what Amanda said, and, and to also say that it's, it's not um, the case that we sort of um, apply a standard lens to our assessment of um, any particular evaluation or, or research project, let's just say, but we really are um, uh, taking um, the projects, um, uh, the designs as they're submitted to us and thinking about, is this the most rigorous way to assess um, a program or interventions impact, um, can this not be stronger, and really trying to sort of work with applicants as it makes sense in order to do that. We also have information sort of um, for, for applicants. Um, there's a research page that's on our, our website um, that I invite folks to take a look at. That's sort of our general sort of perspectives on um, the types of research that we fund. Um, and again, I just sort of want to land on it's not that we take a pretty fixed lens to how we assess research projects that come to us, but really are trying to think, um, is this the most sort of rigorous way that something can be assessed, um, you know, um, uh, and thinking about that relative to the cost and what the potential for uh, impact is going to be in terms of answering a pressing policy or um, a question. Um, and that's what we're thinking through, um, less about hard and fast rules. Excellent. Well, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, Bronte, if possible to, to please share the closing screen. Um, so I, I'd just like to thank you all for your questions and, and for taking the time to learn more about this exciting RFP and, and AV's grant making process more generally. Uh, if you have a concept that you think would be a good fit for this RFP, please feel free to submit any letters of interest to the email address at the top of the screen. Uh, you can also reach out to Amanda with any questions and can find the full RFP and any relevant contact information by following the link at the bottom of the slide. And as a reminder, we will be sharing the full PowerPoint with everyone who registered for today's event. So 
just want to say thank you all so much for your time and interest. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alexia. Thank Absolutely. you, everyone. Take care.